Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 187. Science Faction, the Quatme period. This sounds like the mutant from Total Recall. Uh, Quato, that is true. This is actually <laughs> named after Quato, who was the dominant life form in the Quaternary period. Wow. <laughs> That's it. You learn a lot of things you wouldn't know when you listen to this show. Take that, Star Talk. The Quaternary period is, of course, the last period in the Earth's geological timeline. We've gone through all of them from the very first to now the very last. So, congratulations, Damien. We did it. We got all the periods down. Last or most recent? Or are you being presumptuous again? If it ended tomorrow, we would still technically be in the Quaternary period. So, yes, up until the most recent. You're right. There could be a future one coming up. This Quaternary period started about two and a half million years ago, which for those of you who are huge paleoanthropology fans like myself, recognize that that is around the time we start seeing the first auspices of our own genus Homo. So that is kind of a, our interesting little timeline mark there. So we start seeing Homo habilis come around around this time, and that will eventually lead to Homo erectus and Ergaster and Heidelbergensis and us and everybody else. And uh, super, super interesting period in Earth's history because of that, A, the rise of the hominids, which came about after that, the spread of the hominids throughout the rest of the world. We see hominids not only make it through Southeast Asia, into Australia, into Europe, then, of course, across into the New World, and then lastly, the Polynesian peoples populating areas uh, like Hawaii and Rapa Nui, something around uh, 800 to 900 years ago. So all of that expansion took quite a long time. Most of that happened in that end Quaternary period. And then, of course, we started the sixth mass extinction, where uh, all of us humans who had spread out across that entire globe started killing literally everything we could until... Well, it's not... Entirely us. Yeah, we could. Part of it was the end of the Ice Age. That's true as well. Yes, there was certainly a, a climate issue that came along with it. And also, you're right when you say it wasn't entirely us because it is, there's a lot of us killing things indirectly. In the same way, 95% of the many millions of people who were in the New World died after European contact. They weren't all stabbed by conquistadors. Most of them died of smallpox, right? So yeah. they still died. Be- not, not like intentionally either. Yeah, yeah. They died because, it, it because communicable accidental. diseases yeah. were able to move through the populations. So most of them died without even ever seeing a European. They, they died from the diseases that moved faster than the people did. So in the same sense, we brought things like rats to a lot of places that devastated eggs and lizard and other populations and any kind of ground-dwelling birds. Uh, we bring different animals to different places, and they devastate the local ecology. So... Sometimes it's us directly, sometimes it's us indirectly, but there's a lot of us. We've been killing a lot of stuff in the last uh, two million years. Uh, so that brings it up to the timeline. If you have listened to the last 20 or so episodes, you can learn about every single geological period in Earth's history from the very, very beginning before the moon had even been knocked clear of us by a planetary impact to right up to now, where we have cities and people and boats and airplanes all roaming around this beautiful flat Earth. All right. <laughs> I was about to say, and satellites. Yeah, all right. Shill. Uh, speaking of shills, I, of course, am your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. And I also like this part of the show because it's the only part where you're forced to call me a comedian. That is true. It is the one time that I'm really forced to lie on this show. And, of course, our scientist for the evening, Mr. Seb. Seb, how are you doing? Good. I know I called you doctor last time. You got offended because you didn't get your PhD yet. Well, so I wasn't offended. You were offended. I was just being technically accurate. <laughs> I had to do something recently, actually, because of that flat earth debate. Somebody had listed me as a PhD in archaeology, and I, I felt the same way. I was like, stolen valor! Stolen valor! Not me! <laughs> do you go into malls wearing lab coats yeah. and everything? <laughs> That's right. Try and get a discount. <laughs> you should be giving me the discount! <laughs> And you can, of course, check out the video of that Flat Earth debate, which is up on our website at www.thesciencefaction.com, where you'll also find a bunch of links to the articles we cover, as well as some we didn't get to. And please, guys, if you wanted to start a new intro bit, go ahead and tweet us at Faction Science, 
and let us know what new intro bit you'd like us to do. We've already done the periodic table of the elements, the four fundamental forces, the geological time periods, and the logical fallacies. But what other small, quick, repetitive thing can we do that is crucial to scientific understanding and being an educated citizen in the year 2017? Let us know. And just like the person who suggested geological time periods earlier, you might be the person who authors the next Science Faction intro bit. If there's still time to Bodie McBoat face this thing. One <laughs> vote for euphemisms for cock, and he has to do it because there's no other ballot. There's no other <laughs> ballot cast at this moment. Oh, how dare you? How dare you? This use, is... use democracy against Bobby. Okay, we're going to have to declare martial law on this podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, guys, article number one, the Cuban brain game. This is a super interesting article that came out. It kind of flew under the radar for as interesting a story as it was, in my personal opinion. I actually had to check a few sources to make sure it wasn't like a bullshit weekly world news article. Is it like a mix of Sudoku and salsa? The, uh, there's the Cuban, Cuban brain, brain game. Oh, I got yeah. you. <laughs> Stay on topic. <laughs> It is similar to that, only involving the long-term maiming of U.S. diplomats. So uh, the story is that apparently in the fall of 2016, at least five U.S. diplomats began experiencing unexplained hearing loss and other physical symptoms while serving at the embassy in Havana. Can't handle the mambo? Stay out of Havana. <laughs> well, nights. It was so severe, they returned home to the U.S. for medical treatment, and one diplomat will actually need a hearing well, aid. Why did they as come a result home? I thought injuries. medical treatment was amazing in Cuba. Well, first of all, they would be on a U.S. base there. They wouldn't, be, yeah. they wouldn't have access to the rest of it. I wouldn't say medical treatment is amazing, though it is prolific and free, which is kind of nice. Abby's. Similar to our military. But they don't have any resources. Not a lot. I mean, they have doctors, uh, and they're not as well trained. It's like being in the military. Like, I, I grew up under U.S. military medical care. Everything is free. The care is fairly substandard. It's not what we would experience here in, in, in a regular hospital. You're not always being treated by qualified professionals. A lot of times you have corpsmen instead of nurses and doctors, whatever. But in the end, it's Kinda free. Kind of like alternative medicine. You're no, alternative medicine would be non-medicine. <laughs> <laughs> These Some, are still medical practitioners <laughs> following the proper treatment. They're just not always super experienced and stuff like that. Somebody who has to stick you five times with a blood draw yeah. <laughs> is different from somebody doing acupuncture. And that's very true, yeah. He's, they still have the right idea. <laughs> but I will say this, for all of my complaints, it was still free, and as much as I got hurt as a kid, it would my parents likely would have gone bankrupt without that system. So it worked out well in the end. So what they think is going on with these do with these guys, with these uh, U.S. Embassy personnel, is that they're actually being sabotaged using what is currently an unknown sonic weapon. Sounds kind of like a conspiracy theory, right? Like, doesn't yeah. this sound like so the, the Cubans are using sonic rays on our diplomats to try and get them to lose their hearing? Uh, I'm picturing Fidel, because this was a few years ago. Fidel Castro himself walks into this. It was last this. year. Okay. Well, Fidel Castro's brother, <laughs> Hermano Castro, <laughs> meets this Cuban mambo guitar player who can hit notes so high that can ruin ears. And <laughs> Well, what this is, is they think it's a, a sonic weapon where it works outside the range of human hearing. And so the U.S. immediately kicked out a bunch of Cuban diplomats from their embassy in Washington. They're still not even sure that it's the Cubans. It, quite frankly, could be the Russians, because the Cubans aren't known for their super advanced sonic weapons, you know? So, like, if you're thinking of who might be more likely to build and utilize something like this, what Russians would be a more likely origin point. Were, were these diplomats, like, isolated in a room together? Well, they were, just in, be they were in the embassy. Were, yeah, so wouldn't it just be everyone in the embassy then? Anybody who was within a certain area of that particular device, right? So, like, so you'd like, have to be exposed to diplomats, secretaries, and people yeah, who so maybe, weren't going in and out of their office. And, right, right. So it, maybe it was just people in one wing. Maybe these five people all worked in the same part of, or the same area. Maybe you needed repeated exposure. We don't know yet. We don't know where this device was. We don't know if it's a targeted thing. We don't know if it was something implanted in the embassy. I just don't understand the, the motive. Like, what? Okay, so now you made the diplomats deaf. Right. So good question. One thing which I found really funny is that since apparently since like the 1960s, we've had like a spy versus spy game with the Cuban <laughs> uh, embassies where like we kind of spy prank them and they spy prank us back. This sounds more like two rival fraternities. It really back is. Each other yeah. If they were state sponsored. <laughs> For no <their> rules. <laughs> it was even worse back in the 80s when they made all those uh, Cuban guys take 
brutal beer bongs. Just like huge. It was like three funnels big. It was. That's like good. Guantanamo, man. Getting hazed in Guantanamo <laughs> was fucking terrible. <laughs> By the way, also the name of the least likely country song ever. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're thinking they might be doing that to us. Either the Russians or the Cubans might be actually attacking those diplomats in that fashion. We only hear sound waves between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. So we have this narrow range. Same thing with light. We only see certain wavelengths of light. But you have to imagine there's this broad spectrum of both light and sound that exists outside of our ability to directly perceive it with our ears or eyes. So infrared sound waves travel at a frequency below 20 hertz and we can't hear them but the pressure waves can still go through our body and they can still cause side effects the pressure wave from sound is no different than the pressure wave from anything else from a collision of two bodies you're basically vibrating the air molecules around you so you can create a pressure wave of sound that you might not necessarily be able to hear but you're still gonna be able to feel and it's still gonna be able to have effects on you one of the possibilities is that it's actually affecting the fluid inside the inner ear. And if that happens and you disrupt it and vibrate and overuse that fluid, you can cause hearing loss in these people as well as vertigo. You can cause a lot of nausea and other things. And all of these guys report those same conditions. So that, that's one of the reasons we think, even though we don't know what it is, based on what has happened to these people, we think it was probably some kind of infrasonic weapon. So is it standard protocol at the American Embassy now to wear like those shooting earmuffs that's, all, all around the compound? They, <laughs> They wear those or just big construction earplugs, like those, those big pink ones, and there's a lot of, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> Chalkboards all over the place. Uh, well, what's interesting, I, I, I liked it. They, in the article about this, they mentioned some of the history of this, and some of it was really interesting. Again, this sounds almost sci-fi-ish, but like back in the 1980s, there was an engineer that started having this really strange feeling when working in his research lab at a medical manufacturing company. When he was in the room, he felt depressed, had some cold shivers, he had a feeling that he was being watched, and he would even see people like out of the corner of his eyes. He would have visions, literal visions in his eyes. He would turn around and he wouldn't see it, them anymore. So he was actually seeing things, and he couldn't figure out what was going on. What they ended up finding is that one of the fans in their lab, one of those laboratory-type, industrial-type fans was resonating the room at 18.9 hertz, which is the same resonant frequency of the human eyeball. And the vibrations from this fan were actually causing not only the bad feelings and whatnot, but the hallucinations they were feeling because it was actually vibrating their eye to the degree that they were getting kind of random nerve firings at the back of their eyes. That's freaking crazy. It means that with a, with a janky fan, or even better, a well-tuned speaker, you could theoretically make people around you start hallucinating. Bobby, don't take the magic out of this. This was a haunted fan. <laughs> also, what he's not mentioning in the article was that the fan was never plugged in. <laughs> you know what? Here's why I love scientists, too. I've made this case before about uh, Albert Hoffman and the discoverer of LSD. Think of the, the perspective of the discoverer of LSD. He has formulated this chemical in his lab, and he gets some on his skin. He didn't ingest it. He didn't even knowingly get it on his skin. He just must have. That's the only thing we can assume. He's riding his bike home at the end of the day. He starts having hallucinations, visual hallucinations. You might think, oh, man, he must think he's tripping out. No, tripping out doesn't exist yet because LSD mm -hmm. hasn't been discovered yet until he found but it that day in his lab. No nope. drugs existed. Psil psilocybin mushrooms weren't known for another 10 years. Most of the hallucinogenic effects of... Uh, what about like all the old shaman of d old religions who would do all this hallucinogenic It depends what stuff. they're using. So most of that stuff has been found by cultural anthropologists in the last 50 years, including psilocybin-based mushrooms. Also Things like, like ayahuasca wasn't Americans, known. Even, right, yeah. yeah. So, or in this case, Swiss. Most people didn't know about ayahuasca at that time either. Yeah, if you went to go talk to a shaman, you would know. But Hoffman in his lab in Switzerland had no idea. And he's riding his bike home, has essentially the first LSD, known LSD trip in history. If he was most people, he would suddenly think God is talking to him. He is the special Messiah messenger. He needs to get the word out about, I don't know, riding bikes home, whatever it is. Instead, the fucking logical, cold-hearted scientist goes, huh, I must have inadvertently got some of that chemical on my hand, which is now making me experience this thing as far as I know nobody has ever experienced before. That is science. And that is the same thing as, as this. This is what I like is this guy. He's sitting in his lab. Fucking ghosts are flying through his field of vision. He's like, probably a resonant frequency from the fan. <laughs> That's... That's what I love about science. I love it because you oh, you never think of the easy, cheap, supernatural explanation everybody is always going for. What's the most rational, logical-based solution to this problem? I half expected like the Scooby-Doo gang or something to be behind this. and.
they pull the mask off the ghost and it's the fan. Yeah, it's just the fan. <laughs> So anyway, we've already known that low-frequency sound can cause unpleasant symptoms like sleep disturbances and nausea, but it usually doesn't actually damage the hearing because you're not registering it with your ears. However, if it is this type of focused low-frequency sound that actually can d damage the liquid that's inside your inner ear, then it can, and we think that's what may have happened. Again, we've never seen this before in our own tests. This is only something we can surmise might exist based on what we do know exists, and then start saying, okay, it's probably the Cubans or maybe the Russians or somebody else. Very interesting stuff. I like to think that some of those other countries, whether it is Cuba or Russia, I feel like they give their scientists more leeway. I feel like they're like, hey, what kind of crazy shit can you develop? Give me a laser that cuts through people's feelings. That's what I want. Can you make it? Good. Just try it on that guy. It might, it's not even really leeway. It's like, do it yeah. or we're going to kill you. Yeah. But also, like, forget the IRB. Forget, like, <laughs> we're not going to have any review boards. No, You're no, just they gonna, don't care. They're no, no. By any means necessary. Point it at that guy. <laughs> and he's like, but he's got a kid with him. Eh, fuck it. <laughs> You're saying we have nothing like that here in America? You're saying like whenever a gifted grad student goes missing or is presumed murdered on a college campus, he wasn't actually abducted? I am saying and that. taken to a black site? Yeah. Seb, you're in danger. Any moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move right on to article number two, Neuromyths Among the Educated. This is another super interesting topic, I think, because uh, this, is, this looks into neuromythology and the myths we have about the brain. I think when it comes to medical myths, neuromyths are the most common and usually the most damaging ones that we have. Neuromyths, like uh, that Bigfoot's only use 25% of their brain? Yeah, that's exactly a good Euromyth, because everybody knows if a Bigfoot only used 25% of his brain, he'd be Bigfoot brain dead, right? <laughs> that's a Bigfoot vegetable right there. That's what that is. It's a good tagline. Yeah. <laughs> no, neuromyths are anything like that. Like Damien brought up the very common one, you only use 10% of your brain, that's obviously a myth. Uh, there's other big myths, including, oh, certain people who display these qualities, they're right-brained or they're left-brained, or you only do this type of processing with this with your right brain or left brain. Those are almost all neuromyths. Well, and that being gay is a choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a neuromyth, Wait, right? it's weird that you went redneck with your assertion, though. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, meant, I, I meant to be a much more openly progressive redneck. That's My true. mistake. And these neuromyths, I, I would include things like vaccines cause autism in that, the, though this, that was not a particular one that was studied in neuromyths. That was a little bit well, more... It's just Myths are common. Why are yes. they focusing on the neuro one? I think maybe because they are, they have a special place. I think the neuro myths are particularly prominent in our culture because the brain is so mysterious. You know, it is such a powerful organ. It's also the thing that's the most different between us and animals. So it's the thing we would know the least about via relative anatomy. If somebody wanted to claim, hey, the tendons in your arm allow you to do this, this, and this, or magical ability, well, then you'd have to compare the tendons in a rabbit's arm and a chimp's arm and everything else. It's really the one thing that we don't have a composite comparison from that's anywhere near ours. You know, our brain is so much different than even our nearest relatives, well, the chimpanzees. Well, part, part of our brain. Yes. Like the, most, most importantly, the frontal cortex yeah. is so different that these the rest is the same. Well, not the same. The rest is very similar, very similar yeah, yeah. to a lot, of other, a lot of other creatures. And these neuromyths come about because we are so different, because we can't do that relative anatomy, because a lot of times that inability to do relative anatomy means that that knowledge is hard to get because you just dissect a frog to learn anatomy. You can't just do that with a human brain. Obviously, we're not going to murder people for that, so you'd have to have a dead human brain, so those are in short supply for medical students and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of these like neuro myths that go along, some of which I even believed, which is one of the reasons I liked this article. I always like when I get proven wrong. Two of the ones they mentioned you were must that, be a very happy guy. I am. I'm an <laughs> incredibly happy guy. Never when you're here, though. Weird. <laughs> uh, so like one of them was, do most people with dyslexia see letters backwards? And I would have thought that was true, but I guess that is actually a myth and in fact there's a lot of transposition and other things they in the vast letters as numbers yeah <laughs> <laughs> they see letters as colors that's dyslexia right <laughs> and then one of the other ones that i definitely adhered to which is individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style now there are different learning styles and abilities and we and sometimes those have different effects but they aren't always your preferred learning style. So I think that would be one of the, the trip-ups there. Even things like the Mozart effect, which has been proven wrong over and over again. Listening to Mozart does not make you temporarily smarter. That would be weird. Um, but there is a Beethoven effect. Yes, of course. If you listen to Beethoven, of course you're going to be smarter. Makes you want to buy a St. Bernard. Oh. <laughs> Things like we have covered on Science Faction is not true before, but you will talk to a lot of people who believe things like sugar causes children to be hyperactive. It absolutely does not. And we have done literally hundreds of studies that have shown this over and over again. My child has type 2 diabetes, yeah. and it's not active <laughs> at all. It's, 
What that turns out to be is just the perception of what's going on. Usually when kids are having sugar, they're around things like birthday parties or going out to dinner. They're not eating their typical food. And because of that, they're doing something else that's stimulating them. You show it to parents and they go, oh, it's because of the sugar. And we've shown over and over again, they've done a bunch of really interesting studies. But correlation is causation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the problem is we view that too quickly, right? And so we've done a bunch of interesting studies where we will have a big party, you know, a bunch of uh, kids running around and you'll give half of them non-sugar drinks that they don't know are artificially sweetened and half of them sugar drinks and then you'll ask the parents and they cannot tell the difference. They will always say, "Ah, oh, that one's on sugar. That one's on sugar." Or vice versa, you can do the same thing with telling them they have non-sugar drinks and giving them sugar and they'll automatically attribute their actions as being less hyperactive. Interestingly enough, the same thing holds with alcohol. It doesn't get you drunk. It doesn't get you it's drunk, just really. Going to the party. That's interesting. That's just all psychosomatic, <laughs> yeah. huh? It's just terrible tasting water. I can't feel a thing, officer. Well, no, I don't know why you pulled me over. <laughs> I'm glad we're here dispelling myths on this podcast. <laughs> so anyway, the problem comes when anybody assumes that their knowledge, their inherent knowledge is correct without basing that on fact, myself included. Again, I believe the dyslexia thing. I would have believed the learning preference thing. And it's good every once in a while to go through and look at what the actual facts are in research. Even things you think you know, like, oh, I think I remember a teacher telling me that. He was a pretty smart guy. Well, fuck it. Maybe the information has changed. Maybe our data has changed. Maybe you remember it wrong, or maybe he wasn't that smart to begin with. Or he was smart, but he was just wrong about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And so all of that means that it's always a good idea to go back and double check things. And then to kind of embrace the idea that is behind science, which is there's nothing wrong with getting proved wrong. The One of the problems, I think, is we have a societal idea that being wrong is somehow a problem, like getting proved wrong. There's a big issue with that. But in science, getting proved wrong is how you discover anything new. Every single important scientific paper was telling somebody else that they were wrong. And until you get the idea of like, well, I'm just going to go with the proof, whatever I've been told doesn't necessarily hold weight. I need to actually find a justification for it. Until you're able to justify something like that in a way that's repeatedly able to be confirmed, like scientific peer review publication, then you're never going to get yourself closer to truth. You can repeatedly stated is often interpreted as repeatedly confirmed. True. Even you're right. with scientists. You're right. You know, outside, they'll be good at science in their specific field, but then outside of it, they act like anyone else. Absolutely. And that, that becomes, it, sometimes it's even worse because sometimes they're so used to being right in their specific field. And we see this with guys who are really good at one specific thing. And then all of a sudden they think, well, I must be an expert at chemistry, right? Because I did super well in physics. Whatever it is, those two are actually fairly related. So maybe you would be, but like... You... I really, I'm a really good gas station attendant, which means I'm really good at politics. <laughs> yeah, it's very similar. But yeah, sometimes those people are even less likely to give up their beliefs because they are so confident in their own abilities in the other field that it kind of leaks into their confidence and, un and makes them unjustly confident in other things. You were saying that every scientist should want to be proven wrong, but right. I mean, uh, we don't live in that world. I mean, isn't every scientific rivalry born out of somebody saying the other guy is wrong? Yeah, yeah. it absolutely is. And a lot of times it becomes and a big dick measuring contest. scientists are very competitive. Yeah, absolutely. And it becomes a dick measuring contest yeah. of like, who? oh yeah, you're right, I'm going to prove you wrong, and back and forth. There, there's some pussy measuring too. We don't want to be sexist here. Absolutely. Rosalind Casually Franklin <laughs> never got the chance to pussy measure. She was burgled. <laughs> so when Damien gets involved, it becomes a taint measuring contest. I don't yeah. know why. Because I'm proud of my taint. Do I need another fucking reason? <laughs> All right. So anyway, keep checking on those things you're not sure on. Always check whether or not you're right. I even had an instant in the Flat Earth debate recently, uh, which we, of course, just put the video up and advertised. The Flat Earth debate where I said something, when I looked back on it, I realized that while it's mostly true, I was actually wrong in what I said. I was talking to him about how... Yeah, you said the Earth was round. Hey, mostly Seb, wrong. Seb, now you're wrong because he <laughs> believes the Earth is round too. Round like a coin. It's not uh, spherical. Right. God, it's good. Don't it's you know good. anything about shapes, Seb? I've just been, it's been repeated so much I know. that the earth is round that I well, believe it now. Here's a good example. So we were talking about that particular thing, and, and I, I researched the idea that ancient cultures did not actually believe that the earth was flat. That's a myth that we have. You know, we know the Greeks calculated not only that it was a globe, but that they calculated its actual circumference 300 years BC. So we know that they had advanced knowledge, and they saw ships going off, and top of the ship would be the last thing. So... They, they knew. navigated with stars. They navigated well. with stars, all that kind of stuff. So they knew for a long time that the Earth was round. Now, I listed a bunch of cultures who believe that, and in one of them, I included the Maya. The Maya, a lot of people, a lot of researchers believe, did believe in a round Earth or a spherical Earth because we have the Dresden Codex. One of the problems with the Maya is literally every single one of their documents that they ever wrote, all of the, the parchments and the papers and stuff that they made, were all burned except for five. We only have 
five, five paper written documents of the Mayan era because the Spanish burned everything. One of them is called the Dresden Codex for Dresden, Germany, where it now stays. That particular codex maps lunar eclipses and supposedly predicts lunar eclipses. It would be difficult to be predicting and mapping a lunar eclipse without a spherical Earth model and a heliocentric spherical Earth model. That would be very difficult to do. However, to the credit, because I made the statement the Mayans believed in a spherical Earth, I don't know that for sure. They might not have predicted those eclipses. They might just have written them down after they happened and claimed to have predicted them, or we're interpreting them as predictions. This and guy... you don't need a spherical Earth model to write down when a lunar eclipse happens. So I still think they probably knew they had a spherical Earth. They were doing a lot of advanced mathematics, a lot of advanced calculations. They had an advanced, ca advanced calendar. But I don't know that for were sure. Were they sailors? They did have off coastal boats, but we wouldn't call it anything nothing like a sailing. Because oftentimes it's like the the cultures that had a lot yeah. of sailing that realized it. Was and we right. know they made it to nearby islands. We don't think they 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 didn't have any kind of like large type sailing ships. You have to understand the anacondas that they ride are afraid of going into deep water, oh, so right. it's really just coastal. <laughs> like how Damien confuses like what continent these people are even on: <laughs> Central America, South America, same fucking thing. It's all the same. Yeah. But anyway, so that's a good example of something you should go back. This was even after I, was, I did that in the debate. I, as I was editing it, I was like, I should just go back and check this. I went back and checked, and I was like, you know what? I'm actually not satisfied for sure that they knew that the Earth was round. You should always question what you believe, especially if you're not 100% sure, and especially if you haven't done the research in a few years, maybe. You know, go back. Maybe something new is published. It's a great example of how even experts, because even the experts, the public believes 68% of these neuromyths, educators believe 56%, and respondents with neuroscience science training believed 46%. So even the experts in this particular study were getting it wrong at almost How a half rate. How do we know this article is not a neural myth? Oh, that would be a good one. We need to actually look at the study <laughs> itself and the data. We're all getting played. <laughs> all right, guys, let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. All right, I Call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yep, coming off Let's a win. Do it. I won last week. Uh, I and, don't think I remember that. No, no, it happened. In fact, <laughs> really? I, I encourage our audience to go. In fact, I called my shot like the babe oh, at really? the start of the game. <laughs> well, interesting, because I actually don't remember what happened last week. So maybe Damien's telling the truth, maybe it's not. But for what I remember, Damien has never won in this game. Let's go, though, Damien. Maybe this can be your first time winning in I Call BS. Do you see... Our fans can easily go, they should question everything. Uh -huh. Question what he just said. Go look, go listen to the last episode. Uh -huh. And then, by the way, uh, he since he's willing to damage his credibility right. just to shit on me, question everything he says. He's, in fact... Yeah, that's right. I'm not an authority. You should not take what I say for sure. You should, you should go look at the articles on our website, www.thesciencefaction.com. And if you do choose to abandon this I Call BS to go back and listen to last week's episode, as Damien is advising you to do, then let's just go with statistics and just say this episode ends with Damien losing. Just assume that <laughs> if you're going to just stop this and go back to the last episode. All right, article number one. Researchers have finally found out what happened to the ancestral Pueblo people of the Southwest by using turkey DNA. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but as the Native Americans called it, maize. It would, no, turkey. that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> yes, they, they didn't have a, a word for Erdogan. They just <laughs> called it maize. Oh, God damn it. All right, and Seb? Uh, this is probably science because, as we know, some people have claimed that Native Americans were descendants of the Jews, so why couldn't they be descendants of the Turks? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you guys really both went out of left field, didn't you? Okay, fair enough. He's playing your game on this one, Damien. That's how he's going to win. He's really, it worked for me last week. <laughs> uh, article number two. A new study suggests that heavy drinking among U.S. adults has gone down in the last 15 years. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. I think uh, uh, millennials have had a, a, a Rosie the Riveter, like, let, let's all pitch in. But and just with wine is what you're saying? Well, alcohol in general. Oh, okay. I mean, not specifically wine. I think that's why the craft brews have been taken off. I think that was sexist of me because you said Rosie the Riveter, and I just assumed it would be wine. Gay men also drink wine, Bobby. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> All right, and Seb? Uh, yeah, it's probably true. I mean, it's like every year we know more about how bad alcohol is for you, so 
I would imagine people stop drinking as a result. All right. Article number three. A new study shows that chimps can be taught to play paper, rock, scissors at the level of a four-year-old child. Damien, is this science or bad science? They can be taught to play paper, rock. I've never heard of paper, rock, scissors. We had this conversation. As we were starting this game, I've never heard of this game. As we were starting this episode, just so the audience knows, (laughs) I was briefing them. I was telling them what the questions would be, give them a little chance to think about it. And uh, when we were doing that, I brought up paper, rock, scissors, and they both looked at me quizzically um, because Damien doesn't know anything, literally. He has never (laughs) heard of any games or things that people do. Talking to the champ of this game. He literally. He literally. took a ball of paper, wrapped it around a thing of scissors over a rock, like crumpled it over it, and threw all three through my window, thinking that this was the game I was speaking of. Performance art. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And Seb said, no, it's not paper, rock, scissors. It's rock, paper, scissors. So very interesting thing. I I guess maybe I just call it different, something differently. When we looked it up, it does seem to be more people are going by rock, paper, scissors. So in the spirit of the last article we talked about, I will switch to the vernacular rock, paper, scissors, because apparently that is the way to say it. If you're just tuning into the show now for the last two minutes bobby's in justifying why he's an asshole who <laughs> pronounces things wrong but i'm going to say science and no need for a quote-unquote joke because we wasted enough time all right and seb yeah i think science do a reward game system and they figure it out although the chimps call it cellulose blades stone yeah that sounds about right <laughs> and lastly article number four <gasps> A 13-million-year-old skull that researchers believe to be a common ancestor of all living apes was just discovered in French Guiana. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science because you would have lost your shit in the article section, and you wouldn't have pushed it back to the I Call BS section if this was true. All right, and Seb. That's a good argument, actually. <laughs> this show is it's, heavy... got, it's got to be bad science because it's in Latin America, and you would have thought it would be in Africa if it's an ancestor to all apes. All right, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. Researchers have finally found out what happened to the ancestral Pueblo people of southwest United States by using turkey DNA. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. Very, very interesting. You know about those ancestral Pueblos that have those beautiful cliff dwellings that are still around today. Uh, They're creating multi-story building, community spaces, and plazas. They had a very advanced civilization. They eventually got kind of pushed out by people that would later we would later call the Navajo. Most people don't know this. The Navajo are actually people that didn't get to America till after white people. They came down from Canada in the 1500s, and even though they now represent colonialists, I know they represent the largest tribe in the United States right now, and white people beat them here, which is kind of funny. So, so the they, Navajo gentrified the Pueblo They did. People <laughs> they out. really did. Except they had cooler buildings. The and Pueblos course, had cooler white buildings people and stuff. are blamed for everything. Yeah. The Pueblos had way cooler buildings and way more advanced stuff. So uh, anyway, long story short, they got pushed out around the 1200s, and we're, we weren't sure exactly what happened to these people. And you might say, well, can't you do DNA Wait, testing? how was that after... Later, the Navajo later occupied that oh, area. Okay. So they and they pushed out the remainder that were along the edges and pushed. So them they back. started pushing them out in like the 13th century. No, we never knew. We didn't. That's the thing. We didn't know what made them abandon their structures in oh, the 1200s. Okay. So sometimes we thought it was a drought uh, that came by and ruined their crops. We're still not 100 percent sure what exactly pushed them out or where they went. At least they built the city on an Indian burial ground. Right. <laughs> but now we have a pretty good idea. We thought for a while, based on a couple of some linguistic evidence and some other stuff, that it was likely that those people migrated to the northern Rio Grande Valley area. But we couldn't prove it. And one of the reasons we couldn't is a legal technicality that comes into play anytime you're working in the United States when it comes to archaeology and human paleoanthropology, which is that for the most part, the tribes will not let you do any testing on human remains. So, we have plenty of skeletons of Pueblo people, but we can't go and test their DNA legally. Ironically, one of the things that come up is, like we said, that got replaced by Navajo people. Ironically, a lot of the times the people making the decision on whether or not we can test the DNA are Navajos, not the Pueblo people for whom those remains actually belong to. But that's just the way the law works. And so regardless, we can't test it and say, like, okay, here are the, here's the DNA of the Pueblo people. Now we see the DNA of that looks like their current ancestors here in the northern Rio Grande Valley. We've solved the puzzle. So we can't do that, unfortunately. And you have to kind of find these workarounds. 
One of them is the turkey, which was domesticated in North America. And these Pueblo people made really good use of the turkey. In fact, they had bred their turkey so specifically that by the time that they broke up in the 1200s, their turkeys, and we know this because of the turkey bones that we find at their archaeological sites, had a specific lineage that basically had some genetic abnormalities that were unique to only this group of turkeys at this time. We then can now look at the turkey remains we're finding of the people in the northern Rio Grande Valley starting in the 1300s and 1400s and see a continuity of that turkey lineage. So we know that at least the turkeys migrated from these Pueblo settlements in the southwest to the northern Rio Grande area. Likely that means that those people moved there as well and those previous ideas are kind of confirmed a little bit. Again, not 100%, but this looks like very good evidence about what happened to those Pueblo people, though we still don't know why. Super, super interesting stuff. Perhaps their turkeys, where they were, were jive. <laughs> that was probably it. <laughs> Article number two, a new study suggests that heavy drinking among U.S. adults has gone down in the last 15 years. Damien says false. Seb says true. And this one is bad science. It's actually gone up. So they did two surveys. One was in 2001. One was in 2013. In the first survey, 65% of Americans reported that they drink alcohol. In the second survey, that number climbed to 72%. High risk drinking went from almost 10% to 12.5%. The increases were especially steep for women, minorities, and those over the age of 65. And you might think, like, why is this happening? Like Seb brought up, shouldn't it be going the other way? We now have a better idea of how bad drinking can be for you. Uh, we're no longer in the Mad Men era of just, you know, swilling booze all day at work. You kind of have some more responsibility. I don't even think they did that then. I think they probably did. A lot of dudes recovering from World War II. Constantly drunk all the time. They just did. They didn't have to compete with women, and very few people had college degrees. And like, from what I understand, essentially 100% of people coming home at 5 p.m. were wasted by the time they were. Yeah, after work. A lot more drunk driving. uh, Yeah, but after work. So you'd think, you know, based logically, that the the drinking would go down over the past 10 to 15 years, but it looks like it's not. And one of the reasons they brought up, which I thought was really interesting, was that alcohol is getting cheap. So we don't necessarily think about it but uh, as much now, but alcohol is getting way, way cheaper because alcohol distributors are having to compete with things like online wholesalers. And so all of a sudden you have people being able to buy – you know, two six packs for what it used to for the cost that it used to be for one six pack, and you have people able to get really, really high alcohol percentage hard alcohol much cheaper. That's the one that's gone way down. Like high percentage vodkas and uh, gins and scotches, all of those prices have gone way down from where they were only 15 years ago. And in general, what we see is when prices of alcohol go down, the amount of admissions to emergency rooms for alcohol overdose or alcohol poisoning goes way up. The amount of people drinking goes way up. It's just a logical economic process. You take the price down, more people are going to use the product and use more of it. So an interesting thing might be we might have to start jacking up booze prices in order to fix it. Yeah, I might have some problems with the survey because, you know, like when they classify what a problem drinker is, like those standards aren't calibrated to real people. Like you consider you know, yourself the real person it's calibrated. Well, to. like 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 they're calibrated it's like lab nerds and stuff. You oh, know, I gotcha. like like you know, if, if you drink anything like over a keg a week, you're all of a sudden a fucking alcoholic, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I don't I don't need a test telling me what my sponsor has already told me. <laughs> Well, that and along with it, the like we said, the admissions to hospitals have gone up as well. All of that seems to coordinate with more people drinking and more people drinking more alcohol, too. Hopefully that gets maybe evened out a little bit by all this legal weed stuff. Because, again, this was back in 2013. Uh, they haven't seen what's happened since Colorado, California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and all these other states have said, fuck it, you guys can all just smoke weed. Most of the time when that happens, at least studies from Colorado show, a dramatic decrease in drinking and DUI. Well, is booze still cheaper in those states? Yeah, but and now then, it has competition. You know, now if somebody was is like, oh, I'm going to go out and have a party, but maybe I don't want to drink. Maybe I'll instead I'll you know smoke a little bit. Then they're probably not going to have it. And we've known from before, while it's not like weed is some miracle drug, you can still crash your car on weed. It's still dangerous to get super high and drive. No, it's you, impossible you, to crash your car. You, on weed. you, you don't you, even have to drive. Yeah, just, just let it go. Hands off, I'm, I'm high and I'm, I'll be driving fine. And there can be health effects from the smoke itself, just like smoking anything, there can be health effects. While all that is true, over and over again, studies show that alcohol is a far more dangerous drug than marijuana. In fact, alcohol is one of the most dangerous drugs that we imbibe. It's right up there with heroin in terms of the problems that it causes. Yeah, which is why I gave up drinking recently myself, and I've just had to up my dose of prescription opioids. To yeah, that, that is how you're supposed to do it in America. 
All right, article number three. A new study shows that chimps can be taught to play rock, paper, scissors at the level of a four-year-old child. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. Seven chimps of different ages and sexes living in the Primate Research Institute in Japan were part of the experiment. They sat at a booth housing computer-based touchscreen and were trained to choose the stronger of the two options based on the rules of the game. So basically, it was a, they had an iPad on there, and they were teaching them how to play that way. These chimps basically learned how to play it. Now, here are some caveats. It took them longer than it takes a child to learn how to play. So even like a young child, a three- or four-year-old child, they can pick it up much quicker. Three- or four-year-old child usually takes about five repetitions of the yep, game. Yeah, this was in Japan? Yeah. Okay, you're comparing to Japanese kids. That's true. It's even hard. That's yeah. right. So. But these are also Japanese chips, so... <laughs> <laughs> much less feces on the touch screens than if they were American chips. <laughs> The kids picked it up quicker, but then they could play at the same level. Now, something really interesting happens between the age of about four and five, where a child gets the cognitive ability to start playing the game better based on their opponent. They start measuring, okay, I'm not just going to do rock every time. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I, I am going to play the partner, which is really the only way, unless you're, you can tell what they're going to do beforehand, you, the only real way you can get a strategic advantage in, in that game. So... They learn to do that around five. Before they hit that milestone, they play exactly as well as chimps. Again, it takes the chimps longer to learn, but the chimps can play just as well as that four-year-old. Once they click over, and then kids hit that about four or five, once they click over and they're able to do that predictive modeling a little bit better, they start blowing the chimps out of the water, just like they would the three- or four-year-olds. What if you're a, a sociopathic adult who doesn't uh -huh. can't get in the minds of Oh, other then you people. can't read it. Yeah, there's no empathy. It's rock, rock, yeah. rock. I feel like you still have the logical capability to understand that that's not going to work. But, you know, I, what, let's try. Who's let's try. <laughs> you know what, Damien? Let's try afterwards. Let's play a game. <laughs> All right. Article number four. A 13-million-year-old skull that researchers believe to be a common ancestor of all living apes was just discovered in French Guiana. Both of you guys thought this one was false. And this one is bad science, which makes Damien our winner. However... I must say this as a caveat. However, I don't like this. Damien said that this particular article was false because I would have made more of a deal about it. In fact, it was false for the exact reason Seb said it was false, which is while they did find the 13 million year old skull of the ancestor of all living apes, it was found in Kenya, in Africa, where of course that skull would be found. That was your clue. So Seb keyed into the clue and said the right answer for the right reason, as opposed to Damien, who said, the, the right, right answer, answer for the wrong reason. As such, I'm going to have to give an extra point to Seth. <laughs> this is unprecedented. This is un You're right. It is unprecedented. <laughs> Tying the game, and as we know, the tie always goes to the scientists. So it's congratulations, Seb, for taking this once more with your proper answer. Indeed, this fossil was found in Kenya. It's a fossil of a baby ape, and it comes from a time that's critical to the timeline of ape evolution. So around 13 million years ago, this is when we see the split off from the last related ape, which would be the gibbon. The gibbon is our least related ape ancestor that's currently alive. And so we see this split back then. So we think this is probably a progenitor species, not only to us, not only to chimps, not only to gorillas, not only to orangutans, but all the way down to the lesser apes, the gibbons. That's really neat. This, this is pre-gibbon. Yes, pre-given. Pre-given separate. You yeah. know. That's a really neat thing to find because this is, again, we can look at this thing and say, wow, this is another piece in our shared genetic history that we have with every living thing on Earth. If we go back far enough, this is one of those branching points or nearby one of those branching points we would see. This is the progenitor of every living human and every living humanoid and every little th everything we consider an ape came from something that looks like this running around East Africa 13 million years ago. All of those just bring us closer to where we came from and our human origin story that science tells us. Super, super interesting. Congratulations, Seb, on that valiant win. I happily accept the win. I'm, I'm yes. going to appeal. I'm going to appeal. This, this okay, is unacceptable. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Is... hold on. Your appeal is being heard. Can you make your case, please? Yes. Appeal denied. All right. <laughs> this is unacceptable. This is... All right. And Seb, I believe you wanted to tell our audience about something before we left today. Oh, yes. Please check out my YouTube channel, Galileo's Telescope. There's a new video up on the Gender Inequality Index. Galileo's Telescope. Uh, with, with an apostrophe? Yes. Galileo's with an apostrophe. All right. Well, check out Galileo's Telescope. And thank you so much for joining us for 187, where you learned about the quaternary period how the Cubans are playing brain games with our diplomats, why we all believe in too many neuromyths, what happened to the Pueblo people of the Southwest, why heavy drinking has gone up in the U.S. over the past 15 years, how chimps can be taught to play rock, paper, scissors, 
and the 13 million year old skull we found in Kenya that's ancestral to all living apes. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 188. In other news, somebody used a sonic laser to attack U.S. diplomats and spray paint Cuba House rules on the side of the embassy. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.